Well, hello, Emmanuel members and friends of Emmanuel. Uh, Pastor Eric here, and I'm delighted and honored to be able to share the message with you today. Uh, doing so from my home, as we're in the midst of this order to stay at home here in our state. Uh, and so I hope you're doing that. I'm definitely doing that as we try to flatten the curve and uh, get beyond this whole pandemic that we're dealing with now. Um, so again, uh, going to be bringing you a message today, uh, continuing our sermon series, The Road to the Cross, as we're in this season of Lent, and uh, <clears throat> looking today at John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. So if you have your Bible, I just encourage you, open to John chapter 12, 1 through 11. We're going to be working through that. I'm going to read it here in a minute, and then we'll also jump around to a few other passages as well. So before I do anything, I want to go ahead and pray for us. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another day to live and draw breath and to love you and praise you and give you glory. Uh, God, I pray for your peace for all who are watching today as we're in this really crazy, uncertain time dealing with this pandemic. God, I just pray uh, that you will help us know that you are in control, that we can trust you, that you are greater than even this. So, Lord, I just pray your blessing on all of us today as we spend time in your holy word. May we be blessed as a result, and God, may you be glorified by the state of our hearts after spending this time with you and in your word. Pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, well, as I said, we're in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. So I'm going to go ahead and read this now, and then we'll unpack it here in this message. So it says this, John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him, objected, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. All right, so uh, that's our passage for today. Quick recap as to what brought us up to this point. So again, uh, Jesus has this friend Lazarus who is sick, and Jesus knows it's that this sickness is going to lead to his death. Uh, but instead of going right away to see Lazarus when he finds out that he's sick, which most of us would do, right? You hear a loved one sick, you're going to go and see them. Uh, Jesus does this odd thing, and he waits. He waits for two days, and during that time, Lazarus dies. Well, then Jesus finally goes, and when he arrives, he's met by the sisters of Lazarus, Martha and Mary. And they both have the exact same statement. Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Now, we don't know if that's kind of an accusatory, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Or if it's more just solemn, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. We don't know. It's hard to tell from the text with the inflection and the tone. We don't know. But what we know is that they believe Jesus was able and had the power to save their brother. So I think that's the most important thing, that they know that that was the case. Well, then there's this amazing thing in chapter 11. Although Jesus knows that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he's still deeply moved when he sees the grief of the people. In verses 33 and 38, it says that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled when he saw their grief. 
And then the super profound verse 35, shortest verse in all of scripture, Jesus wept. That he's so moved by their grief that he grieves himself, that he weeps as he sees it. Again, I've said that I think that's not only reveals Jesus' full humanity, that he's just like us, that when he experiences grief, he's moved and, and weeps himself. I actually think it also reveals the full divinity of Jesus. In the Psalms, we read that God is full of compassion. That means deeply moved by us, by his creatures. And that's what we see here from Jesus. So I think his full humanity and his full divinity are in display in those two words, Jesus wept. Well, then Jesus goes to the tomb where Lazarus has been dead for four days. And the Jews believe that after three days uh, that the spirit left the body. So by day four, he is definitely dead. Okay. Well, Jesus goes and raises him to life on day four. And, and that really shows that he has power over death, even when it seems to be definitive. And that doing that really sets in motion the plot to kill Jesus, as Pastor Dave preached on last week, uh, that, he, that Jesus raising this guy from death to life uh, was just too much for his opponents. They realized that now people were really going to start flocking to him and they needed to put an end to this. So today in our passage, as you, as you just heard, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, um, a short time later, Jesus is back in Bethany, and he's hanging out with these siblings at a dinner in his honor. And it says that Lazarus is hanging close to Jesus. Uh, I can imagine if some guy raised, if I was dead, some guy raised me to life, I'd want to hang out with him too. I'd want to be right by this guy. So Lazarus is close by Jesus there at the table. It says, Martha is doing what she always does. She's busy preparing and serving the meal. She's the consummate hostess. And then Mary is doing what she always does too. She's living in the moment with Jesus. Now, previously uh, in the Gospels, we've heard that there's been some friction between these sisters because of their differing approaches to Jesus. Uh, so I want to look back at Luke chapter 10. Uh, Luke 10 verses 38 through 42. So if you have your Bible, Luke 10, 38 through 42. And this is when we first hear about Mary and Martha and, and kind of this friction and how they engage with Jesus. So Luke 10, uh, 38 through 42 says this, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a, a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus said, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Okay, so we see this scene where, again, uh, we learn about Martha, that she clearly has the gift of hospitality and service. Um, and, um, again, it's on full display here, right? As she's preparing, as she opens up her home, she's preparing the meal for Jesus. Um, if you're familiar at all with the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, um, I really like it. I, I, Marissa and I used it in our um, premarital counseling uh, to prepare for our marriage, which actually today is our nine-year anniversary, so that's on my mind. Uh, but I also use it in premarital counseling. Uh, it's really good, and it talks about the five love languages that we have, and two of those are really um we see on display here, I would say Martha's primary love language is acts of service. That that's what she, not maybe that's uh, you know, not only what she wants to receive, but that's how she shows love, through acts of service. Mary, on the other hand, seems to show love through quality time. Okay, now both of those are of equal value. They're both super important. Uh, but when it comes to Jesus... I think quality time with him must precede acts of service for others. I think that's really crucial. 
Uh, you see, if we reverse those and put acts of service first, uh, I think we can start to believe that our acts of service earn us quality time with God. But that's actually the opposite of the gospel, right? That it's not about, the gospel says it's not about works that we have done so that no one can boast. It's about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, right? Um, so again, I think quality time truly is, <laughs> we could say it's the primary love language for God. Uh, that God does so desires quality time with us. Uh, the, the great commandment that Jesus gives, love God and then love others. There, there's a, an order to that, right? Same with our mission statement, to know Christ and to make his love known. Again, both are super important. We need both of them, but there is a proper order to them. Uh, it's important, too, if all we do is focus on our own quality time with God and it's void of any acts of service, we're also neglecting half of the great commandment. And we're saying, yeah, I love God. Well, yeah, but are you loving others? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? So we need both. Both are equally important. And yet I also think that they have their proper order. Um, so I think Jesus' response to Martha, right? You are worried and upset about many things. Um, it's not a dismissal of her gifts, that, that her gifts of service and hospitality, uh, that he's kind of speaking against that. I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, instead, I think he's helping her to reprioritize what is most important, Martha. Uh, I also think it's important to say Mary probably isn't neglecting um, helping Mary at all, or Martha at all. It's probably not that she's totally unwilling to help Martha. She just has her priorities in order. So when Jesus shows up, she's dropping everything to be with him, whereas Martha is just is in a fuss and in a frenzy about all the things that have to get done, even though Jesus is sitting right there. I think the key to Martha's motivation here in verse 41, you are worried and upset about many things. Uh, she's so busy fussing about the preparations that she's not focused on Jesus. Whereas for Mary, he says this in 42, only one thing is needed. Uh, we're always to keep the first thing first. And the first thing is Jesus, right? And faith in Jesus. Uh, that's the best thing. That's the most important thing. Keep that front and center. It's what Mary does. All right, well, back to our passage today from John. Again, that, that Luke passage just helps to give some background, backstory to this whole relationship. Uh, but back in John's gospel, in this account, John 12, uh, we see this intimate act of worship by Mary. She anoints Jesus' feet with this costly perfume and then wipes his feet with her hair. Talk about being fully in the moment. I mean, she is just so focused on Jesus and on de being devoted to him and worshiping him. It's like no one else is even in the room. What's interesting is there's a similar scene that we see in the Gospels. Uh, I'll just look at Luke 7, uh, 36 to 39. Luke 7, 36 to 39. Uh, we read about... Jesus being anointed in a very similar way by a sinful woman. Okay, This is not believed to be Mary, but some unnamed woman here. And here's what it says. Uh, again, Luke 7, 36 to 39. <clears throat> now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him. And what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. I always love that the religious leaders are, are always so self-righteous. Oh, she's a sinner. Right? That's why when Jesus says, let you without sin cast the first stone, it's like, 
which of us aren't sinners? Which of these guys weren't sinners? But it was always pointing the finger at someone else. Uh, what's amazing with this account and our John account, uh, it's a different woman, and yet we see the same devotion to Jesus. Uh, what's interesting is in the John account, uh, it's Mary and Martha are the hosts, right? And so uh, they're supposed to be there. They're putting on this party. Uh, in this case, it's the home of a Pharisee, and this woman shows up. She's like an uninvited guest who has to get near Jesus. Uh, now, it's interesting. Basically, there's this exchange between Jesus and this Pharisee, Simon, um, about <laughs> kind of this why would you do this with this sinful woman? Uh, and then Jesus says this in 44 through 50. This helps to unpack kind of the common practice around uh, what we see in both these passages with uh, anointing someone and, and washing their feet. Okay, it says this. Then Jesus turned toward the woman and said, said to Simon, the Pharisee, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell, her, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. Okay, and then Jesus tells the woman, your sins are forgiven. It's this really amazing scene, right? Um, and again, the common practice was when a guest would enter a home, uh, the servants of the host would typically wash the feet of the guest. Again, they wore sandals, they were out walking in the dirt, feet were very dirty, and so when you enter someone's house, uh, that was a real sign of respect. But it, the host wouldn't do it. The ser their servants would wash the person's feet. Again, that's why when Jesus washes his disciples' feet, it's just such a profound moment in his ministry uh, as he serves them. Um, but again, that was a common practice. And then if it was an honored guest, uh, they, the host would often anoint the head of the honored guest with oil. Well, in this case, again, the woman and then again, Mary, not only washed Jesus' feet, and this woman washes him with her tears. I mean, what an amazing scene. Uh, but they anoint his feet with oil, uh, with this perfume. Uh, again, it could be that, that they just didn't see themselves as worthy as anointing his head. Uh, but I think it just spoke to their absolute humility that, that they just saw themselves as wanting to serve him and worship him. So they washed his feet. They put it, they, and they even went the extra mile to put perfume on his feet. It's also interesting that this woman is kind of what we might call a pre-believer, um, when she comes in, she's probably filled with fear and trembling, like, what's going to happen? I'm going to go and approach this rabbi and, and engage him in this way. Uh, but then at the end of it, at the very end of the verse here, Jesus says, or passage, Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So I think she comes to faith in the midst of this. Uh, Mary, on the other hand, totally believes in Jesus. Uh, we know that she believes he's the Lord, the Messiah, that she's following him faithfully. So you have these two women on a very on very different points of their path of faith. Um, and yet in both cases, they demonstrate extreme humility in the presence of their Lord. They just fully engage in worship. Uh, back to our passage for today, it says that uh, Mary used pure nard, uh, which was a an expensive perfume. Again, the fact that it's pure uh, meant that it was especially expensive. Uh, likely was imported from outside the region. Uh, we read later uh, in our passage uh, that it was worth a year's wages. So it was the equivalent of a annual income for a laborer. So this was really expensive stuff that Mary had been saving and then pours out on Jesus, uh, which is really this amazing act here. Uh, the whole piece about Judas, um, I think that, that really just drives home the extravagance of her gesture. Uh, the piece, you know, saying that it was a day's wage or a year's wage, uh, and and Judas objecting to it because it was worth so much money. Now the whole little piece about him being a thief and stealing from the money pot, yeah, that's basically John, you know, a fellow disciple, kind of just 
saying, oh, yeah, Judas used to do this. He's kind of adding his own commentary about what Judas would do. Uh, but really, the point of it is just speaking about how extravagant of a gift and extravagant of a gesture this was by her. Um, she's been saving her very best for Jesus. Um, then Jesus affirming her act when he says, leave her alone. <laughs> it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Uh, I was saying about that, um, you know, and what I think is really powerful about that piece is I think it's an important reminder for us. She could have saved it and, and anointed Jesus with, at his death. Uh, which was the typical practice of burial, as we saw with Lazarus. They would anoint, put perfume and spices on the dead body. Um, as it started to decay, it would <laughs> save it from smelling as bad and all that. There was that whole ritual. But instead of saving it, she has Jesus right there in her presence. And she's going to seize that opportunity to worship him. Uh, I think for us, we might be just living content with our own salvation waiting to enter eternal life, right? I know that I have the promise of eternal life, so I'm content. I don't need to worry about it. Uh, I think this is a good reminder for us to live in his presence now and to live for him by making his love known to others. I think that's what we're being taught here. Now, verse 8 might seem to contradict that. Verse 8 is this uh, kind of controversial verse where Jesus says this, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Um, people often hear that and they think Jesus is just being callous or indifferent towards the poor. Uh, but again, I don't think that's the point. I think what he's doing is reminding them to keep their priorities in order. You will always have the poor. It's a reality in this life. There's going to be poor people. There's going to be broken and hurting people. You'll always have those opportunities for ministry. But he's telling them, I won't always be here among you, right? Uh, Jesus knows he's going to be crucified, resurrected, and then uh, he will ascend back to heaven. And so this is temporary. Like, don't miss it. Seize this opportunity. Um, again, I think Jesus is reminding us here, uh, them and us, that devotion to him must always come first. Um, and then devotion to others, like the poor, will flow naturally from that. Keep the first thing first. There's a proper order. All right. The interesting thing is that it seems like Mary is keenly aware of what's coming for Jesus. It's almost as though she knows what's about to unfold, this whole plot against his life. So she seizes this opportunity to show her devotion to him. She doesn't want to miss this moment. Again, then the passage ends with this large crowd coming to see both Jesus and Lazarus. Uh, again, think about it. You know, they want to see Jesus. He's the guy who raised someone from the dead. But Lazarus has kind of become a local celebrity. He's the dead guy who's now alive. So they want to come see both of them. And then Jesus' opponents, the chief priests, uh, now they have set their sights on both of these guys. Jesus, they know. I mean, he's the ultimate trouble. They need to get rid of him. But they're saying, we got to get rid of Lazarus, too. I mean, he's this now powerful witness to Jesus' power, and we don't want that. We need to take care of him as well. So it really starts to ratchet up and escalate here. All right, well, some takeaways. Um, and, and I don't want to just give takeaways in general. I want to give takeaways specific to living amidst this pandemic right now. Um, because I, if you watch that uh, little midweek message that I gave on Wednesday, I provide a little teaser for this sermon. And um, what I talked about in that is that this passage is all about intentionality when it comes to being in Jesus' presence, when it comes to worship, uh, that we need to see this as an opportunity to really spend time with Jesus as we're isolated, as, we're, uh, have, as our lives have been disrupted in this way. Um, I'd imagine that many of us are feeling like Martha these days worried and upset about many things, right? <laughs> and for good reason. I mean, we're dealing with a global pandemic. I mean, this doesn't happen every day. Uh, for many, they've never seen this in their lifetime. So this is a very unique time in which we're living. And um, so I think it's fair to feel 
uh, worried and upset about what's going on. Uh, there's so much uncertainty for us at this time, and it's so easy to focus on all the craziness that's going on. Uh, and, and I think what that does is it leads to fear and anxiety and worry. I think Jesus is inviting us through this passage to be more like Mary. We're invited to choose what is better and which won't be taken away from us. We're to focus on Jesus and on his love. That is better. That will never be taken away from us. Nothing can take that from us. I believe Jesus is inviting us in this season to once again put him first. If we focus on him and his perfect love for us, Scripture says that fear will be driven out. That's what we're invited to do right now. Put him first so that fear will be driven out. Now, I get this is a scary time, and I think it's made even more challenging by the fact that we can't gather together for worship. Uh, and, and perhaps we're all feeling a bit isolated, especially if you're living on your own. I mean, you are feeling tremendously isolated right now. Um, I get that. Um, but here's the thing. For both Mary and for that sinful woman <laughs> that we read about, um, when you think about it in that moment, everything other than Jesus went out of focus. And it was as though he was the only one in the room with them. Maybe through all of this craziness, God is working to refocus us on him, to bring everything else out of focus so that he becomes more clear, so that we can see him more clearly and make him our focus. So friends, as we continue through this Lenten season, I want you to be reminded that God is not focused on all the ways that we are unworthy, okay? He's already made it clear through the cross that he's dealt with our sin once and for all, and we are now counted as worthy and righteous because of him. If he was able to take care of that, then he's able to take care of this. Remember that he is holding you now. And remember that nothing, if he's holding you, there's nothing in all of creation, not even COVID-19, that can ever separate you from his love. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for that truth, for that reminder here today that you are holding us, that there is nothing that can take us from your grip. God, I thank you for this passage of scripture today, these multiple passages where we see full, true worship on display, modeled by these women. God, that they just let everything else go and focus on you. God, that's what we need right now. As scary and, and uncertain as these times are, I think that's what you're teaching us. Let everything go and focus on you, Lord. Uh, so, Father, I just ask that you would uh, stir up our faith in this time uh, when it comes to the fear and the worry and the anxiety, God, while those are all natural to feel, uh, Lord, I just pray that you would see, help us see those as invitations to draw closer to you, to lean on you, to put our trust in you, knowing that you are greater than this, knowing that you will see us through this, and knowing that no matter what happens, that you have one eternal life for each and every one of us, who has put our faith in Jesus Christ. So God, may we live without fear. May we uh, just live out your great commandment to love you, to put you first, but also to love others, to reach out to people, to call them, to check in on them, but also to isolate ourselves so that we can keep people safe. And then God, we just pray you will bring us through this and that as a result of this whole crazy time, that we will be stronger in our faith, that we will be stronger as a church, that everyone in this world will be drawn more closely together and that we will have greater unity in our country and around the world because you have brought us through this. And Lord, may everyone know that you are the one who brought us through it and kept us safe. So we pray all this now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, friends, God bless you. I, I just uh, pray that you can find peace. I hope this message encourages you and uh, just know that uh, 
we're here if you need to talk and we would love to uh, just stay connected as best we can. And uh, I believe we will be, I will believe God will get us through this. So God bless you and uh, bring you peace in this time. Take care.